Thank you, Diane. Uh, it feels like it should be my statue speaking instead of me, but <laughs> I'll try to make it a little bit relaxing now. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you all for coming uh, here. I would like to speak today about this incredible feat that our brain is doing when it is uh, reading uh, words. I want to start by a nice work of art that I saw a few months ago, actually, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, is Fragonard. Uh, who shows us a lady reading. And um, uh, it should be stupefying, this picture, not just its breathtaking, the quality of the painting, but the fact that what you see here is a primate closed and reading. Uh, I would just want to remind you that we are all primates, that we were not meant to be doing such activities, and that it should be surprising that we are able to do such activities at, as reading because our brain did not evolve for this feat. And I would like to show you how it is possible that we are able to learn to read. Uh, what is reading? Um, I would like to remind you that if you had not learned to read, any page of any book would look to you like this uh, Rosetta Stone. It would look like a texture. Basically, reading is taking a texture of letters and managing to transform it into speech, language in your head. That's amazing. That's a remarkable invention. Several people have commented upon it. Uh, Francisco de Hevedo, for instance, a conversation with the deceased, a way to listen to the dead with my eyes. It's amazing. We can speak to the dead, or well, listen to them at least. Um, the art of communication, communicating thoughts to the mind through the eye, the greatest invention of the world, Abraham Lincoln. And I especially like what Vladimir Nabokov, one of my favorite writers, has to say about reading. He says, we are absurdly accustomed to the miracle of a few written signs being able to contain immortal imagery, involutions of thought, new worlds with live people with sleep, speaking, weeping, laughing. It's, of course, this incredible referential power. Starting with a few signs on paper, we can refer to almost any thought that we've had or that we will have. So how does this work? Well, here's a movie that was made by colleagues at MIT using a technique f which is called magnetoencephalography, which is a way to uh, look at brain activity not just in space, but also in time, in the time dimension, uh, millisecond by millisecond. And the movie is what happens in your brain when you see a single word. Okay. Um, you might not recognize this, but this is the left hemisphere of the human brain. Uh, it's been inflated so that you can see inside the sulci in the computer. Normally, it's all folded together. And in colors on top of it, we can see the uh, time course of brain activity. Uh, it's very fast, although it's been slowed by a factor of at least 10 here. Um, so I will uh, point you to the appropriate frame, you can see that activation starts in the back of the brain here in the occipital lobe, and from there it progresses along the ventral surface, and uh, suddenly after about 200 milliseconds, or so one-fifth of a second, it explodes into these areas of the left temporal lobe and inferior frontal region here. So what's going on? What is this? Well, we begin to understand uh, the sequence of processing which is happening here in the brain. Like any other visual input, a visual word starts in the occipital lobe, that's where the primary visual area is located, but very quickly it progresses through the ventral face of the brain, and here uh, it uh, uh, reaches a level of a specific region that my colleagues and I have studied, and we have turned it actually, the visual word form area. Regardless of where the words are presenting on the screen, all of the written words are channeled to the specific region of the brain that deals with the recognition of the written word. Uh, the orthography of the word creating a unique code, a sort of address for the written word. From there on, as you could see in the movie, you get activation of a lot of areas. The exact connections are not completely understood at the moment, but some of them have to do with accessing the meaning of the word, which specific, le which specific lexical item it is, uh, what's the meaning of the word in the context of the sentence, especially in the case of these more anterior regions here. And uh, there is another pathway which leads to understanding the pronunciation and the articulation of the word. There are so-called two routes for reading, one that goes through the pronunciation, another that goes to the meaning. 
all of the areas that are represented on the schematic diagram are attested, they all exist in the brain, so uh, we don't know their exact function in many cases, but we know they are all contributing to reading. And uh, therefore, I would like to you to remember, first of all, that, that reading is a collective activity of many areas in the brain. But one area in particular is very important, is this area in red, because it serves as a sort of interface between vision and spoken language. And in particular, all of the regions in green and in orange here, they are regions that are not unique to reading in the sense that they can also be activated by spoken language. So uh, we have a spoken language system which exists already in the child before learning to read, and learning to read essentially consists in connecting vision to the spoken language system. We know the spoken language system exists already quite early on thanks to uh, studies of the human baby. Now, of course, the human baby cannot read, uh, but uh, uh, this is the cover of my book in French, actually. Uh, but uh, the human baby can listen to speech. And we have here in the room, of course, a specialist, Janet Worker, who has studied uh, the com competencies of the baby uh, for a long time. Uh, my wife is also responsible. In fact, the papers that you mentioned were, were my wife's paper, for the most part. Uh, she's in my lab, and we work together. She'll be here next week and she'll be speaking also in Janet's lab. Um, so thanks to uh, the, the work that has been done in human infants, we know that their brain is extraordinarily organized very early on for speech processing. And in fact, uh, brain imaging techniques have been applied uh, to uh, the baby's brain. Uh, that's really a new frontier of research because very little is known about it. But uh, we have seen that when you present spoken language, even to two months old babies already, the language areas of their brain are being activated in the left hemisphere along the temporal lobe and inferior frontal region, so-called Broca's area. These areas are extremely organized, and you can already see that they are activated in a specific temporal order, starting with areas close to the primary auditory cortex and then moving further or backwards with slower activation. So there is, a, there is a tight organization which matches already quite well the adult uh, brain organization in a baby. And of course, that's in an extremely young baby at two months of age. Certainly, there is not yet a lexicon, there is not yet a syntax. But in the coming years, in the uh, first year, in the second year, in the third year, all of these systems are going to fall in place. And so by the time the child is ready to learn to read, uh, we can say that he has an extremely organized spoken language system. And the same is true for vision. The visual system is organized early on. The child is able to recognize faces, to recognize objects. Um, so the problem of reading then is really the problem of creating an interface. The great invention that Abraham Lincoln is talking about is the ability to code speech in a novel manner, which was totally unanticipated by evolution, which is uh, through uh, vision. Well, the finding has been that this cannot be done or doesn't seem to be able to be done by the whole of the brain. There is a specific brain region that is able to acquire the knowledge of orthographic patterns of uh, the written system of a given language. And perhaps the greatest discovery here has been the incredible reproducibility of this visual word form area. Um, this is where it's located. This is actually my brain. Um, you might recognize the absence of hair. Uh, and, um, well, that's this area here. It's seen by transparency. It's really on the ventral side of the brain, on the bottom of the brain. It's in the left hemisphere. And uh, I want to give you several surprising facts about this, uh, this region, as we are discovering them in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years. The first remarkable fact is that it is extraordinarily reproducible across cultures. Uh, you can scan any people in this room, regardless of the specific script you've learned. You, we will find this area in five minutes in any MRI scanner. We will find it in Chinese readers learn, reading Chinese. We'll find it in Hebrew readers reading from right to left, in Arabic readers. We'll find it in French, in German, in English. Regardless of the complexity of the system, it's always at the same rough location. At the question stage, we could discuss there are small differences between languages, but by and large, we're all using the same circuit. Um, it's always located at the same coordinates. When we do brain studies, we have a certain system for framing the brain. It's a very simple X, Y, and Z system where we just correct for brain size. And nevertheless, in spite of this simplicity, the coordinates are reproducible within just a few millimeters. Um, 
We know that this system is causally related to your ability to read because, God forbid, if you have a brain lesion in this particular site, you will lose the ability to read. And this happens reproducibly. It was first described in 1892 by uh, Desjardins, a French neurologist, and it still is reproducible to this day. Uh, it can be a very small lesion. Uh, this is the case here of uh, an actual surgical lesion for epilepsy that made this person unable to read uh, words. And uh, it's called pure alexia, this syndrome, because it can be quite pure in the sense the person is not blind. She can still recognize objects. She can still recognize places, faces, and so on. And also her language is not really affected. She can speak. She can comprehend spoken language. And uh, best of all, she can still write. And that's the most amazing of all, perhaps. You can still be able to write, but not be able to read what you have written or read any sort of written language. So a very selective system, which has to do with recognizing the written word. Um, now, we know that it activates to what you've learned. It will not activate to any sort of script. It will activate specifically to the scripts that you've learned to read. There is a very nice experiment that shows that if you present Hebrew to people who don't know how to read Hebrew, they will not activate this area. But the very same stimulus in a brain that has learned to read Hebrew will activate this area. So this area is becoming tuned, in a certain sense, to the script that you learn to read. Um, we know that it is processing stimuli at a pretty high level. Yesterday I was speaking about our experiments that were showing that this area uh, is computing an invariant representation, invariant for the case, for instance, in which the words are presented. You recognize words in uppercase, in lowercase. It is this region which is the first, which has the relevant kind of invariance. It is also the first area that recognizes words regardless of where they are on the screen. Uh, left or right of where you look. Initially, words that are left or right project to completely different hemispheres, but this area is the first one that puts it all together and everything converges to the left hemisphere. And finally, we know that this area is doing its work completely non-consciously. We can activate this region with stimuli that are subliminal so that the subject in the experiment swears that there was no word at all on the screen, but this area has been activated. And this, is, uh, this was the subject of yesterday's talk. So an amazingly automatic system, highly attuned to the problem of recognizing visual words, highly specialized. And the great question is how this is possible. It seems almost like a miracle. Why? Because uh, cultural objects like writing systems are extremely recent inventions. About 5,000 years ago, writing was invented. They are optional. They vary from culture to culture. Um, they are acquired through learning. They cannot have been a selective pressure to design a brain system or to change our genome to shape the human brain to facilitate learning of reading, especially because until recently, reading concerned a very small fraction of humanity. And also because, as Woody Allen might have said, um, the more you read, the less you reproduce, of course. <laughs> so how is it possible that we have this reproducible, specialized brain region in all culture, which is there to acquire the visual knowledge of orthographic patterns, a sort of cultural map, if you'd like? It's, this area is so reproducible that it participates in a sort of mosaic. You all have in your brain, in the left hemisphere, if you look at it from the bottom like this, you all have this arrangement where there is a region that responds to written words, surrounded on one side by a region that responds to object, on the other by a region that responds to faces, and even more immediately, a region that responds to places and houses. We all have the same arrangement. Now, we can understand that there are regions that respond to faces because maybe there was a pressure to represent you know, socially important stimuli in our species for millions of years, but why words? That's the mystery. And I would like to propose what I call the neuronal recycling hypothesis to try to explain this mystery. Uh, the idea is that um, this is not such an inaccurate picture of what we are. We are primates uh, with a big brain, sometimes a big beard as well. And um, therefore, our brain is uh, not free of uh, the constraints that apply to all primate brains. We have strong anatomical and connectional constraints that are inherited from our evolution. We have organized neural maps that are present early on in infancy and bias subsequent learning. And I would like to argue that culture is not 
free in the human species, cultural acquisitions are constrained and uh, they are possible only in as much as they fit within this pre-existing architecture, which of course has a fringe of plasticity. But, uh, you know, people speak a lot about neuronal plasticities these days. You have to realize that neuronal plasticity is possible on a genetic basis. There are, of course, so genetic rules that allow the brain to adapt to the external world. So my argument is that cultural objects, every one of them, must find their neuronal niche a set of circuits that are sufficiently close to the required function and sufficiently plastic to be partially recycled for the novel function. And I'm going to argue that cortical territories dedicated to evolutionary older functions are being invaded by these novel cultural objects. Their prior organization is not completely erased and they exert powerful constraints on cultural forms, on their acquisition, on their adult organization. Um, now, many of you will have recognized here something which is similar to the idea of exaptation by Stephen Jay Gould or tinkering, bricolage by François Jacob. It's a similar idea, of course, that evolution is making use of older uh, functions. There is something different here because um, we, I am really speaking about developmental time, not evolutionary time, which is a completely different time scale. I'm talking about a situation where there is no genetic change, but there is the reuse by learning of functions that are already present in the brain. And this leads to specific predictions. We'll see several of them in this talk. Um, one of them is that there should be cross-cultural invariance. We tend, when we look at the world's writing system, we are impressed by the diversity. But according to this view, we should be impressed by the commonality, actually. And there should be strong commonalities that are imposed by the brain itself, as well as regularities in the cortical representation of cultural inventions. Second, learning should be constrained by the amount of recycling, and we should be able to predict the speed and ease of learning in children by the complexity of the required cortical remapping. And I'll show you at least one example of that, the case of mirror errors, mirror reading in, in young children. And third, and that's more speculative, but there might be gains, of course, by learning a cultural invention, but there, there might also be losses because the cortex is a fixed surface. And if we have to make room for a new ability, we might lose a little bit some of the older uh, ability that uh, was being recycled. So education can lead to gains, but also to losses, and the two have to be weighted against each other. So um, let's look at these different ideas. First, recycling the brain for reading. What are we recycling when we learn to read? Well, we know that the ventral visual pathway of all primates contains evolved circuitry for invariant visual recognition. And the area that we are using to recognize written words uh, has an equivalent in the monkey brain. The same Broadman area, the same cytoarchinectonic area exists in the monkey brain, it's here, and it's already being used, of course, for object recognition and face recognition in particular. So, uh, of course, this is not to scale. We have to normalize for size. The human brain is enormously bigger, but a similar ventral pathway organization for the visual system is already present in the monkey. And uh, I will argue that neurons in this, res in this region already respond to an alphabet of shape descriptors, and that we adopted many of these shapes for uh, the foundation of our writing systems. Um, so let's look at uh, what this area does in the monkey. This is, we know it's organized as a sort of hierarchy starting with the primary visual area and with subsequent synapses moving to the front of this region. This is the back of the brain. And we know that at different steps in this circuit, you can record neurons that have increasingly more abstract properties. Um, this is an example of a single neuron in the monkey brain that was recorded by Tamura and Tanaka already 10 years ago. And this particular neuron you see is firing here, but not anywhere else in this matrix. It's firing to just one particular object in this matrix of 100 stimuli that were successively presented to the monkey. This neuron happens to be firing to the chair yeah, for some reason. It's quite remarkable that you can find stimuli that the neurons will prefer the neurons have a certain pattern of preference for shapes in this area. It can be quite invariant for small change in location and so on. What uh, Keiji Tanaka has found is that many of these neurons have, in fact, a certain simple shape that they like to respond to. So you can start by finding a neuron that has a preference, let's say, for the hand or for a cat 
or for an apple, or for a, a, this is an interesting example. This is the case of a Japanese scientist turning the back to the monkey, and suddenly the neuron fires. Okay, um, you can find these preferences, but what Tanaka has shown is that you can simplify the picture and find a simpler cue to which the same neuron will fire just as much, or sometimes even more. So you can simplify the Japanese scientist to a black dot on top of a slightly bigger white dot. Okay. You can simplify the hand to a forking pattern of rectangles. Um, and when you look at these different patterns that the neurons will respond to, they form, according to Tanaka, a sort of mosaic of responses on the surface of the cortex. And uh, the idea is that they are, these are essentially shape descriptors, a sort of shape filters that, by a mechanism we don't fully understand, provide a sort of lexicon of shapes that makes you able to store a neural code for any new shape that you are going to see uh, in your life. Um, so we can find, for instance, neurons that respond to faces of the monkeys or of the humans next to uh, more abstract seemingly neurons that respond to the contours of objects. And quite amazingly, they already respond to, uh, they already respond to things like T shapes, Y shapes, epsilon shapes, and so on and so forth. That's why I purposely use the term alphabet, because really it is a set of descriptors uh, that can be applied to many different shapes of the world. Uh, why these particular uh, configurations make uh, neurons fire, we don't fully understand uh, how they are extracted, but we know that they can be very useful. For a long time, people have speculated on the importance of non-accidental properties in vision. The idea is that the contours of objects, when they are projected on the retina, they project according to certain singularities that can be recognized and are very useful to recognize because they are largely invariant according to the rotation and particular lighting of the object. So for instance, when this cube hides another contour here, you can see this characteristic T-junction. The presence of a T-junction is a good indication of occlusion of one object by another. And so that's probably why it's, ex it's extracted by the primate system for millions of years. Now, um, the importance of this configuration is illustrated by this whole experiment by Irving Biederman, in which you take objects and you delete these sorts of junctions. And, I think it's a little bit challenging to recognize these objects now. Uh, but if you delete the same amount of contour but keep the junctions, you can see that the objects are quite recognizable. These are the original objects. So the idea is that uh, we have this vocabulary of shapes in the monkey brain. And of course, we humans uh, have reused the same vocabulary in our writing systems. Is there evidence for that? Is there evidence that the writing systems are constrained by these particular shapes. Well, uh, a colleague in California, Mark Changizi, made this amazing count in all of the world's writing systems of the presence of certain configurations of lines. He basically um, counted all of the possible ways that lines can intersect with each other, and he counted how many times they occur in languages throughout the world, in written languages throughout the world. And he found this amazing statistical regularity that in all of the world's writing system, you have the the same frequency profile with certain junctions being very frequent, like L or T, and others being much less frequent, like the delta, for instance. Yeah. Um, and it's not trivial, right? For instance, the first, the, the three ways that there can be uh, two lines is L, T, or X, if you uh, consider only topology and not the particular orientation. Okay. L is more frequent than T, is more frequent than X. It's not trivial at all, because if you drop matches in the floor, on the floor, you will see that it's the contrary. The X's will be much more frequent. The L's are especially rare. They require quite a coincidence. So why is there this regularity in the world's uh, writing system? It turns out that it's exactly the same regularity as in natural images. If you count junctions in natural images, you will find the same sort of regularity that Mark Changizi was describing in cultural systems. So the story here seems to be that our brain are first adapted to the statistics of natural images, either through genetic evolution or through learning. And as a consequence of that, our writing systems have evolved um, uh, haphazardly, of course, probably not intentionally, but progressively they have internalized these regularities so that more often than not, we put these highly frequent uh, junctions of lines in our writing systems. So, here is at least one cross-cultural regularity. There are many others, of course, like the presence of lines themselves, the highly contrasted stimuli, the small size in the fovea, and so on, that characterize all of the world's writing system and that fit our brain, our primate brain. 
Um, we tested more directly the role of the line junctions in reading by doing an experiment very similar to the one I showed you with pictures, but now with words. So we started with pictures where we could delete either the junctions I think this is the case here, or we could delete some line segments outside of the junctions, and we also had scrambled versions of these pictures, and we did exactly the same to words. And you can test for yourself uh, whether this word is readable or not. It's quite hard. Huh? It's easier when you keep the junctions just like in pictures. Uh, so we have the same effect, the Biederman effect. Uh, we have the same effect that deleting the intersections of lines makes reading more difficult, just like it makes picture recognition more difficult. We looked at the brain level, and at the brain level it's quite interesting. First of all, we have this wonderful controlled stimuli now. We can stimulate the brain with this or with this, and one is readable, the other is not, although both are a little bit difficult. And you can see that this creates this major activation difference. This is really the visual word form area now. So it's a very strong activation in the left hemisphere. And in fact, with this very controlled stimuli, it goes all the way to the back of the brain. I'll come back to that, but there is evidence that early visual areas are being affected by learning to read. If we do the same exact manipulation with pictures, we get a different topography. You see that it's bilateral. It involves more of the ventral regions of the fusiform gyrus, such, such that we get a huge interaction here. And that's very important. People have contested the very existence of the visual world form area on the grounds that it responds to line drawings of pictures. So it might not be selective to words. But when you control very nicely for the stimuli, like was done here, you see that there is, in fact, a specialization for words. And this specialization, as I said, can go all the way to areas V1 and V2 at the early part of the occipital uh, system. Uh, there is a stronger response to letters there, perhaps because we learn to read extremely fine print, and so we need a very small receptive fields that are early on in the visual system. But the nice thing about this experiment is we can look at the Biederman effect, the preference for line junctions over just segments in objects or in words. And in objects, we can see that it really is the ventral fusiform gyrus, which is responsive to these line junctions. The idea is that this ventral part of cortex likes to have the presence of line junctions. It's not the whole of the object recognition system. It's not the case for the more lateral regions here that also respond to objects, but they don't seem to have this preference for line junctions. Well, what's remarkable is that the area which is in red here, which is the one that responds to reading, overlaps with the cortex that likes line junctions. So the argument that we are making here is that in part, we can begin to explain why there is a visual area, a visual word form area, because that cortex, first of all, in all primates, likes to see line configurations, and therefore, this is the best cortex in order to learn to read. Okay? It's one of the biases that are present probably quite early on in this cortical region that makes it adequate to learn to read. There are probably other biases in this region. There is a general preference of the lateral cortex for high level of detail inside the fovea, the high resolution region of the retina. And of course, we need that for reading. And finally, the fact that it is in the left hemisphere is probably because that projects quite directly to the language areas of the brain. There are very short connections to the lateral temporal lobe regions that are important for language understanding, as I showed at the beginning. So all together, we can understand why there is a visual word form area at a reproducible location. It's not that there is an organ for reading. This region never evolved for reading, but it has an number of biases that together make a particular spot of cortex optimal, in a certain sense, for acquiring this particular function. Um, we are beginning to speculate now uh, as to how single neurons in this area might be involved in coding individual words. Now, for faces, it's beginning to be understood that uh, neurons are forming a sort of hierarchy. Uh, this is actually a model by Shimon Ullman. Now, there is increasing evidence for that at the physiological level in the monkey, that at the bottom, you have really a preference for just a few segments of the image. But as you uh, climb the pyramid, you have 
conjunctions of neurons that together might detect the corner of the eye, for instance. And if you put them together, you have neurons that respond to the region of the eyes. And if you put them together, you begin to have neurons that respond to the profile of a face. And you, pu you put them together, you can have neurons that respond to a face regardless of the orientation in which the animal sees it. Well, we think it's exactly the same for reading. So this is now a speculative model of what could be happening for reading at the neural level. At the bottom, all you have is line detectors in area V1. As you climb the pyramid, you may have detection of conjunctions of lines forming a T pattern, for instance. If you put them together, you can have neurons that respond to a specific letter now in a specific view, but if you go to the next level, you can recognize a letter regardless of the font or in the case in which it is presented. And if you put these neurons together, you may have neurons that respond to a conjunction of several letters, such as E left of N. This would be a bigram detector, a detector of two letters in a specific order. And if you put them together, you begin to have neurons that respond to fragments of words, morphemes, prefixes, suffixes. And finally, perhaps you have a neural code for the whole word. I want to insist that at any of these levels, we don't think that neurons are ever coded by, sorry, that words are ever coded by a single neuron. Words are always coded by a population of neurons, but the population becomes more and more abstract and independent of the specifics of the display and more and more pertinent for recognizing which words it is, regardless of the case and font. So that's a model, but this model has a lot to say for it, and we've, we've done several tests of it. One test involves uh, presenting uh, subjects in the fMRI scanner with stimuli that are designed to activate hierarchically higher levels of the model. So we start with false font stimuli that are not even letters, then very rare letters that should not be very well coded, then more frequent letters in French. But you see the combinations are not frequent at all, like Q followed by O is impossible in French. Here we have frequent bigrams that should activate these bigram neurons, but the quadrigrams, the set of four letters, are still impossible. Here the quadrigrams are possible, and in fact this could be a word. I think it looks like the name of a medicine, perhaps, here. Uh, we have an automatic medicine name uh, generator, we could sell it. But, um, and finally, you have the real words here. Okay. Well, you can see in these images very briefly that we get more and more anterior activation, exactly as the model predicts, um, as we go through this hierarchy of stimuli here. The activation really moves forward, and that's the case only in the left hemisphere, in the left ventral pathway here. So what we've called the visual word form area is probably separatable, separated into several uh, clusters of uh, neurons that respond to different properties. And we're still trying to resolve that at the single subject level. This is a group image. So it's smoothed by averaging across many subjects. At the individual subject, we believe there might be patches of neurons that respond to these properties. Um, another great thing about this bigram hypothesis is it can explain some of the emails you've been receiving. I think many of you know about this email. Uh, maybe I'll let you read it. It's amazing that you can read it, actually. But I think you can. It's a bit slow. But, uh, yeah, it speaks about research in Cambridge. It's funny, at that time there was no such research in Cambridge, actually, but now there is. Uh, um, so uh, I just focus on the last sentence, which, is, which says, this is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Well, that's not true. If we are correct, and uh, really there is a lot of evidence, the brain processes the letters. And it's not because it's reading words as a whole that you can read this message. In fact, that's ridiculous, because by scrambling the letters, you're scrambling the shape of the whole word, and yet you can still read it to some extent. So what's happening here? Well, we think what's happening is that there is bigram coding. So imagine that you take a word like badge, okay? And the way it is coded at the neural level is by the pairs of its letters. So something like the sum of all of the pairs of the letters. Letters here. Now, what's special about this text is that the first and the last letter has, are always at the correct position. By doing that, you're preserving an enormous number of the bigrams. Okay. And we can show in the laboratory, and this has been done by uh, Granger and collaborator, that it's exactly the proportion of preserved bigrams that can explain how well you can read this text. You've noticed that you're slower than usual, but we, if you can read it, it's because the bigram code is sufficiently similar to the one that you have for known words. Okay. And uh, for instance, uh, maybe you've not even noticed that this word is misspelled, right? There's one uh, pair of letters has been swapped, but that's not enough to change the inner code in your brain for this particular orthographic pattern. 
So um, this bigram coding is still is a hypothesis. Nobody has seen a neuron that responds to a pair of, to a pair of letters. We cannot see single neurons at the moment in a human brain, in, except in very exceptional situations. But we think it's a valid hypothesis, like the neutrino. Maybe one day we'll be able to see it, and it'll be a great day, of course. Um, we think that this sort of data can speak to some of the classical debates in education, and in particular this notion of whole word versus phonics uh, teaching and, and reading. Um, should we teach using presentation of the whole word, or should we teach using specific teaching of the letter to sound correspondences? Well, uh, there, there is a lot of arguments for the whole word uh, method, actually. And I have to uh, say that the whole word notion actually comes from psychologists at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, for instance, one of their argument was that reading is extremely fast. It seems to be almost instantaneous. So it has to be that it's using the whole shape of the word, not the individual letters. In fact, the time to read a word in any one of you in this room is uh, independent of the number of letters. There is a flat curve from three letters to eight letters, you have the same speed of reading. So uh, um, these findings gave people and psychologists, in particular, the illusion of whole word reading. Okay. But we know better now, and I'd like to argue that this is not evidence at all. We think we know now that the brain is making use of every single letter, but what's happening is that uh, it's treating them in parallel. And in fact, this is not true even on the, of young children. So these curves here are showing you the reading times for different grades uh, uh, of children. And as I told you, adults would be at the bottom here and they would be flat. That is to say, the number of letters in the word has no influence on your reading time from two to five here. But you see that for young beginning readers, of course, it's much more serial. They have to read perhaps not letter by letter, but quite serially taking small packets of letter at a time, right? So in them, certainly, there is no whole word reading at all. It's serial. Um, second, even in the adult brain, uh, we think that the brain still relies on letters. All of the priming studies I've been showing you are based on individual letters being processed. What is happening is a concept that was not available at the beginning of the 20th century, is the notion of parallel processing. All of the letters are processed at once. That's why there is this flat curve, okay? Because um, there are millions of neurons that are doing the job, and each one of them is seeing small uh, local evidence, maybe about one letter, but they all work in parallel together, and so it gives this illusion of all word reading. Um, so these sort of exercises, which actually this comes from my son's book when he was uh, learning to read, where you have to match the shape of the word to a specific shape of upper and lower uh, going uh, consonants and vowels is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the way the brain processes the letters. And it, I don't think it's useful at all for the child. Um, but um, I was pleased to see that all of these arguments, which come from uh, the way the brain works in uh, especially adult readers, um, fit very well with educational evidence, which suggests that if you just compare teaching methods and find which ones are teaching the fastest, uh, the uh, teaching of systematic grapheme to phoneme correspondences is apparently uh, has the upper hand in uh, making the fastest change in the child's brain. I want to emphasize that there is no evidence that the whole word method is creating dyslexia. Sometimes people say it's creating dyslexia. It's not true. Dyslexia is a biological genetic uh, impairment. Uh, but uh, what the whole word uh, method is creating is a delay in uh, teaching. That's very clear in the available educational data. And we think it's because it's not matching very well the way the brain does it. The, the brain really needs to focus on the individual letters, initially serially, and progressively much more in parallel. Okay. In fact, there is a beautiful uh, experiment by my colleague Bruce McCandless in which he's taken adults and he's showing them a new artificial orthography which consists of connecting letters, but half of the subjects is not telling them that they are letters. Okay? He's telling them this is a sort of shape, okay? and it looks like a shape, and you have to learn it. It maps onto a word. Okay? And the other, groups, uh, the other group of subjects, he tells them they are letters, and they map onto words. This is the only difference, and then the subjects are exposed to exactly the same stimuli, and they have to learn every day 30 of these words. But the difference is enormous. One group 
which is learning the letters to sound correspondences is learning, the other is learning much, much more slowly. The, the group with whole word teaching is not learning to generalize to novel words. And at the brain level, and perhaps most interestingly, the group which is learning by trying to memorize the whole shape of the word is having increasing activation, not in the left visual word form area, but in the right hemisphere visual word form area. And I find this extremely interesting that perhaps just by misorienting the child's attention or the adult's attention, we might be training the wrong side of the brain in a certain sense or the wrong brain area um, and therefore delaying the acquisition of the appropriate expertise in the appropriate brain side. As we saw, it's always in the same location in every reader who has achieved expertise, so we might as well focus the learning early on on this particular brain area. So that's it for the whole word versus phonics debate, but I, I, a lot of pages of my book are dedicated to this idea, so you can look in there for more details. I want to try to explain another puzzle of reading acquisition, which uh, occurred actually in one of my children, and I was really puzzled by it at the beginning, but I think many of you have seen this. Here is a child, uh, the child of an Italian friend, actually, who has signed his drawing, and you can see that the name is written from right to left. The child is called Leon. Okay. And uh, it's quite frequent at the early stage of uh, writing that children will write from right to left instead of from left to right. They will not notice it. Here is another child. It's even more impressing, actu impressive, actually. This child has written, Theodore, ti voglio bene. Okay. <laughs> Theodore loves you, and uh, it's uh, written in a so-called boustrophedon, as the ox plows in a field. This is exactly the way ancient Greek was written, one line in one direction, the other line in the other direction, like this. Okay? The child has invented it and does not notice that there is a problem. This is not the right way to do it. Um, he can, it's amazing, right? Nobody has taught any of these children to write in the wrong direction, from right to left, and nobody has told them to read in this, in this way, and yet they don't seem to have any problem with that. So what's happening? Um, it's present in all children. This is an old experiment, 85. There are not so many experiments in this, in this uh, domain, but this is a nice one. If you have young children, you can try this. It's a way to elicit this behavior. You ask children to write th their names next to a dot, okay? So you can see that here, the two children have no problem, Lissy and Maggie. But now you place the dot on the right side of the page, and there is a problem, of course. And Maggie is the older child, and she, she's managing to start a little bit on the left and to squeeze all of the letters, and okay, she's written her name. Lissy has no problem at all. She starts here, and she writes from right to left, okay? And when you do this, 90% of the children write from right to left uh, at a certain age. And you can see this as a function of age, there is a peak, at about five or six years, and then it drops. Okay. So it's not dyslexia, it's something that's generic about the child. What is it? Well, I think it might be something like the panda's thumb I'm reading, a sort of sequel of our evolution. Um, we all can recognize these two faces as being the same face, even though they are mirror images of each other. On your retina, they are projecting as completely different stimuli, but your brain is able to tell you immediately that they are the same. We have a mechanism that, have ev that has evolved in a world where there is gravity, but there is not much reason to discriminate left or right. We have evolved a mechanism of generalization of object recognition across mirror images. And it's now been seen even at a single neuron level. But of course, it's a problem for uh, reading, because these stimuli might be completely different words. We have letters like Ds and Bs, which are mirror images, and yet they, they are different letters. They are not the same object. So uh, there is a lot of evidence that our memory is insensitive to left and right orientation. You look at these stimuli, you look at these pictures, and you've never seen them before, actually. You think you recognize them, but they're all wrong. They're all reversed, right? Um, there is a lot of evidence that even babies will do this. In the first year of life, there is a nice experiment by Borstein and collaborators, 1978, where babies generalize to uh, the mirror image of an object that they've been exposed to. Um, inferotemporal neurons do this. If you record neurons in a monkey and you expose them to this sort of stimuli, you'll see that the profiles of firing of the, of the neurons are very similar to left and right mirror images, but much less similar to top-down mirror images, as you can see here. And there is an amazing experiment by Nikos Logotetis where he trains the monkeys with shapes like this. And uh, 
during the training, the monkey only sees one particular view of this three-dimensional shape. So he's trained really with narrow uh, angles around this particular shape. And then suddenly you look for generalization, and amazingly, the same neuron fires here, as you can see, to the exact mirror symmetrical view. It's after rotation by 180 degrees, it's almost in the mirror image view. Right? So there are neurons that really care about mirror images in the brain. And we've done this experiment to try to see whether it's true also in a human brain. So uh, we did this experiment with words and also with pictures. And the idea is based on repetition priming. The, I explained that yesterday in some detail. We can repeat the same image twice. And then what we see as at the brain level is a reduction in activation. But then we can ask, does this count as a repetition as well? Will we see the same sort of reduction in activation when we repeat an image, but now it's in mirror uh, image, right? We can do that with words as well. And so now this is the mirror image of the word piano. Well, the finding is that there is priming in mirror image for pictures at this location, but not at all for words in an adult who has learned to read. It seems really that we have unlearned in this area, this mirror image generalization. So you see the signal from this visual word form area, it still is responsive to pictures. In fact, pictures are very complex here, so there's a lot of response, but you see this priming, which is just as much for the exact repetition as there is for the mirror image of the picture. But for words, you get a lot of repetition priming for the exact repetition, but not at all when you present the mirror image. You've completely lost this ability to recognize mirror images. And what's really remarkable is that the peak of this generalization across mirror images for pictures is the same as the peak of the visual world form area. We don't completely understand this coincidence, but it, but it seems to mean that we are trying to learn to read with exactly the area which is giving you maximal mirror image generalization. So it's not a wonder that children have a problem, also that they have a competence for mirror image uh, reading and writing, because that's what their brain tells them, that a B and a D are exactly the same object, and they have to uh, learn that. I'd like to close in the last uh, three minutes by telling you about the, the latest study we've done with a lot of collaborators in Brazil and in Portugal to look directly at how the brain is being changed by literacy. Um, this was a very uh, interesting set of experiments that involved scanning of illiterate people uh, and trying to compare them with the brain of people who have been to school, like all of you in this room. There are many questions we can ask in this situation. The first one is, we'd like to see what is being changed in the brain of literate people. Is it just this visual word form area, or are there also other changes at the low visual level? We can finally ask the great question of evolution. What stimuli activate this area before you've learned to read? And therefore, we can ask, do we lose, or do we gain when we learn to read? Is there a form of cortical competition with what is being represented before we learn to read in this region? And we can also ask, do the same changes occur when uh, adults learn to read? This is a nice painting I saw in Sevilla, actually. It's, uh, you can see that uh, this is Virgin Mary and uh, she's learning to read. Saint Anne is teaching her. This was an advertisement by the church, one of the earliest advertisements. It was an advertisement for women to learn to read. And uh, uh, so, of course, if Virgin Mary can do it, why not me? Uh, but uh, the question is, what change is happening? Because Virgin Mary is learning quite late here. Uh, is, is, is it still possible for a brain to change? Will the same brain areas change when she's learning as an adult, or is there a sort of critical period here? Um, so we did fMRI, and we also have ERP recordings in many groups of subjects. We had pure illiterates from Brazil. Uh, young people who just didn't have the chance to go to school, and even as adults, remain completely illiterate, unable to recognize half of the letters of the alphabet. Then we had what we call ex-illiterates in Brazil and Portugal, people who had never been to school, but uh, they were able to learn to read during adulthood, and they finally reached a certain level of reading. Never an excellent level, but they, you know, there was a lot of variability. And finally, we had literate. Uh, subjects of different groups. Some were perfectly matched to the original groups of illiterate subjects, and others were high-level literates, like you in this room. So you can see that we have a lot of variability. These are the six groups of subjects, and this is their reading speed. 
And of course, the illiterates are here. They have zero reading speed. And then you can see that reading speed is really is a continuous variable here as a function of the expertise of the subjects. The ex illiterates are here. For some reason, the ex illiterates from Portugal were not very good readers. And the ones from Brazil were a little bit better readers. But basically, what we did then, when we used this variability, you can see that uh, this is accuracy. So now you can see that all of the five groups on the right can read to some extent, right? But their reading speed is enormous variable. So we use the variation in reading speed to regress against the brain activation and see which areas correlate with literacy. And the finding, uh, there, are, there are many findings. We basically scan them with a very complex protocol that involves spoken language, written language, checkerboards, um, all sorts of visual stimuli, faces, houses, tools, strings of letters, full fonts, checkers, um, spoken words, spoken pseudo words. So we have a lot of data here to see what has been changed in our brain. I'll just show you a small sample through this data, especially because time is running short. The first thing we can say is that when we expose these people to sentences flashed one word at a time, there is an enormous difference, of course, between those who can and cannot read. It's quite obvious. The main difference is in the visual word form area here. And that really confirms that this area is the primary site of learning. And here you can see the illiterates are at the bottom. This is the response to checkerboards. You can see that initially, when you've not learned to read, words are very much like checkerboards, or even worse. And then as you learn to read, uh, this response climbs enormously in this area. Uh, so it's really a direct reflection of learning to read. In fact, you can predict about 50% of the variance in reading scores just by looking at the activation in this area. It's the same for young children, by the way. So it's amazing that there is this direct relation between something you've learned and brain activation. The other set of areas are all language areas. You can see that they respond to spoken language. The midpoint here is spoken language. And now the profile is a little bit different. There is no activation by written language unless you've learned to read. And when you've learned to read, the response is about at the same level as with spoken language. So it's quite natural, right? When you learn to read, you learn this interface, the visual area. But you also learn to catch up and to activate all of your spoken language system by vision as I told you at the beginning. So we can see that at the brain level. Now we can ask, what does the visual word form area do prior to reading? So we look at this site that shows a correlation with reading when we present strings. And we ask, what does it do with all of the other stimuli? You can see that it responds a lot to objects, a lot to faces, not much to houses, a little bit to checkerboards. Most importantly, look at the pink curve, because these are the illiterates. Okay? And you can see that the illiterates are enormously high in faces in this area. And then you can see that it decreases in the other groups. And that's significant. It's not huge, but it's a significant decrease here. So what we have, we seem to have a competition between words and faces in this area. Also, checkers decrease. You can see the illiterates are very high here, and these are the ex-illiterates as well. Um, interestingly, faces also increase in the right hemisphere. So it's a little bit like faces are pushed out of the left and towards the right. So we see this very significant increase here in response to faces in this right fusiform region. So a change of lateralization of faces because we've learned to read. In fact, it's not like a complete washout of faces out of the left hemisphere. If we look just at the peak for individual subject of responses to faces, we see no change by reading acquisition. And that's the red curve here indicates how much of a literacy effect there is in these successive shells that are centered on the subject specific peak for faces. So at the peak, there is no change. As you move away from the peak, and of course the face responses decreases by definition, you can see that the literacy effect appears. So what seems to be happening is a shifting of boundaries. Okay. You have a bigger region for faces in illiterates, and the boundary is shifting and shrinking it as, you, as people are better and better readers. I don't want to leave you with the idea that reading is bad for the brain, right? That it decreases everything. Um, in fact, we mostly had a positive effect in many areas. And, and look at these occipital regions, for instance. Here, it's a perfect ordering. It's the illiterates are at the bottom. And for all of these categories of stimuli, there is an increase in responsivity as a function of the reading score. It seems that there is generalization here, positive generalization, because we learn to discriminate very fine shapes by learning to read, and that generalization 
generalizes to the other categories. In fact, one of the most spectacular effects was in the primary visual cortex. In the primary visual cortex, we have this response to horizontal checkerboards, which increases with reading scores, and not for vertical checkerboards. What's happening here is that this cortex is retinotopic. It likes specific regions of the retina. And we think that by reading, we're training this horizontal spot of the retina and of the corresponding primary visual cortex to respond stronger because that's where the words appear. So that's where you need the high level expertise for fine shapes of words. So this region specifically is increased and its activation increases and generalizes even to checkerboards, which are not of course of the same shapes as letters, but there is generalization. So by learning to read, we train our visual system to make very fine discriminations. Now we have behavioral evidence, it's not on this slide, but we have behavioral evidence that literate subjects are better at curve tracing which is one ability which depends on the primary visual cortex. Literacy also changes the spoken language system, and that's also a very spectacular finding of, the, of that study. We are looking now at responses to spoken language, so this is an area which is called the planum temporale, which is in the left hemisphere here, and it likes to respond to spoken language, but you can see that the response is almost doubled as a function of the reading score, and the good readers are on top here. There's no response to written material in this particular region. It really is a spoken area. It seems to code about phonology, uh, but its response is strongly increased by learning to read, and that's replicated also when we present single words here. Um, we also have top-down activation. So when we present speech, we can see that if the task is a task of auditory lexical decision, then the visual word form area will be acti activated in a top-down manner, but not when we present just spoken language in a comprehension situation. What is happening here is that when you've learned to read, you have this additional orthographic code, and if you have a difficult auditory task, you seem to recruit it in a top-down manner, and you have this additional code that you can activate optionally uh, in, for in order to make, for instance, this difficult lexical decision. Finally, we can ask, do these effects require early schooling or are they present in the ex-illiterates when literacy is acquired in adulthood? Um, in fact, all of the previous brain imaging studies of literacy, they confounded schooling and literacy because they compared schooled and unschooled participants. Uh, there is one exception, which is the work of Carreras and collaborators, but it's purely anatomical, and they showed changes in the anatomy of the brain. Now, we separated the two variables by looking at a pure effect of literacy versus a pure effect of early school. Schooling. And the answer is that all of these effects, or let's say maybe not all, but the vast majority of these effects, including in V1 and planum temporale, uh, can be acquired in adulthood. What we've seen is that the ex illiterates have the changes in the appropriate direction in all of these areas. Now, of course, the ex illiterates are not very good readers, and so they don't achieve the same level of reading, and they don't achieve the same level of activation as expert readers in this area. And that's a little bit ambiguous finding. We don't know if with more training, they would reach finally the same level as expert readers. There is no reason to think that they would not because they're exactly on the same line as the other subjects. And it, the suggestion therefore is that all of these effects can be subject to adult uh, plasticity. There are very famous examples. This work was done in Brazil at the time where there was the presidential election. You, you might have followed that recently. The candidate that came third in the first round of the presidential election, Marina Silva, was illiterate until the age of 16. And she became a presidential candidate, was very successful, uh, although she didn't quite make it. I, I would have liked to be able to present the new president. <laughs> but <laughs> so it shows that you can be illiterate and learn a lot late in life, and that's what we see at the brain level. Um, I think I want to summarize by saying that we begin to understand this miracle of reading that Nabokov was speaking about. Uh, we can acquire literacy because, first of all, we inherit a structured and efficient visual recognition system, which is attuned to line junctions and other invariants, both on a genetic basis, but also perhaps because very quickly in the first year of life it becomes attuned to these features, and we don't really know which is which at the moment. The system is plastic, and it's sufficiently plastic to be partially reoriented towards the particular shapes of written words. But I would also argue that the converse direction is equally true. The cultural systems have been adapted to the brain, and generations of scribes have selected written shapes that fit our brain architecture. 
We now understand that the visual word form area is not the only area for, uh, that is being changed by learning to read. The changes induced by literacy go way beyond the visual word form area, and uh, the way they are changed begin to explain a lot of the quirks of this cultural invention. For instance, the fact that mirror reading was possible. In ancient Greece, it was possible to write from left to right and from right to left. This was not a problem at all. It's because, I think, this area has this property of mirror invariance, and we see it again in our own children. It also clarifies, begins to clarify, I think, how reading should be taught. Letters and graphemes first, not whole words. And that's, that's the way it works based in education. I'd like to leave you with a final word that uh, I think what I've told you today, I think is the best worked out example of the relation between culture and the brain, but it's not the only example. There are many other examples uh, where this notion of neuronal recycling could be applied, and I'm very interested in the possibility that in mathematics, for instance, we can understand some of the mathematical intuitions and how the brain is changed by cultural symbols like Arabic digits with a similar sort of model. But there is also tool use, art, especially music, perhaps religion, Perhaps even spoken language might be, to some degree, an instance of uh, neuronal recycling. So in the future, I'll be very interested in pursuing these ideas in other domains. And with that, I'll leave you with a uh, possibility of further reading, if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.